Thank you. So, I'm Walt Campbell. You probably may have heard that before. The, uh, so I moved up here in 1976 to become a teacher at Lower Lake High School. So I did that for 23 years, coached football for 20, year, 20 years, then came down to Middletown as a vice principal of the high school and a principal of Coyote Valley Elementary. I have a couple demarcations when I, how I judge people. And so when I moved up here in 76, there were no stoplights in the county. So I differentiate between before stoplights, makes you an old timer, before, after stoplights, you're kind of a new, new person here. However, we have Supervisor Comstock here. He was here when they built Clear Lake. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Jack Saylor helped fill it. <laughs> so it's been a while. The other demarcation I have is Mr. Potato Head. Real potatoes are plastic. And so I'm a real potato person. It looks like everyone here is a plastic potato. <laughs> real, yeah. Yeah, real, real. So I have a uh, couple caveats. If you get a discussion about Clear Lake and the formation, things I talk about, and you get to the point in the conversation where you have to say, Walt said, <laughs> you are in a bad position. <laughs> so, you know, people who you do want to quote and who are amazingly great speakers and a lot of information, and if you ever see their speaking somewhere, I don't know if they're going to come here as part of this, is John Parker and Dr. Harry Lyons. Uh, Dr. Lyons and I taught at the college for together, team taught for two or three years, and he's just amazing, amazing person and what he knows about the lake. So I'm gonna tell you what I know. I'm a, a generalist, you know, I don't know all the specifics. Chance I may be wrong in some of this stuff has changed because it's such a dynamic research that goes on in Clear Lake. So Clear Lake is really, really old. Jim Comstock's right there. Hey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's really old. And it, it, you, see, you can see numbers 450,000 years old, a million years old. No matter what, it is the oldest lake in North America. It's really cool. Uh, in, because of plate tectonics, and that, that's, that's even cool is that Clear Lake wasn't made here. It was made else. And that's just exciting. And so what happens, and that's because of plate tectonics. And what's happened is because of plate tectonics, by serendipity, by pure chance, the bottom of Clear Lake falls out at one millimeter a year. And by chance, mud comes in at one millimeter a year. If that didn't happen, either Clear Lake would get deeper or Clear Lake would go, th be go through succession and become a huge meadow. But by pure chance, serendipity, that happens. And so the mud in Clear Lake is over 4,000 feet deep. A millimeter a year comes in. It probably has the best history of the world in Clear Lake. I don't know if you remember a couple, couple uh, summers ago, I think Stanford, Berkeley, and UC Davis all came up to do core samples because what they wanted to do is they wanted to kind of predict uh, going through climate change what's going to happen because Clear Lake's been around so long. See, when you're not a good speaker, <laughs> people don't leave, they run. <laughs> Take a breath, they're out of here. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> Did you lock that door? Is that <laughs> I won't stop anyway, but. And so what they've done, they've done, they've done a, uh, it was, it's just really cool is that when they first did the geologic survey to see how, how deep the mud was in Clear Lake, you know, they're experts. And so they come up and look at the lake, kind of get an idea. And typically, mud's maybe 60 feet, 80 feet deep. So they, they bring a, a barge out, drill a hole in the, in the, in the soil, or the mud, excuse me, and they drill a hole. Ooh, hey, Luigi, we need more pipe. <laughs> As they kept going and going until you know, 4,000 feet of pipe. And that was a real gross survey, not really sophisticated. 
the people that came up and uh, did their survey was, were looking for what kind of changes have gone in this area over the last 450, 600,000 years, over that 4,000 feet of mud. So what they found out is that they look at pollen, because pollen lasts forever. And if you look at the pollen that's released in the springtime, it gets caught in the mud, you can see what kind of trees are here. And so we know that at one point, this was all oak trees. And then it was all redwood trees. And then the oak trees came back, and then the redwood trees came back. And, that cor and now back to oak trees, and that corresponds to the ice ages. As it got cooler, the climate was better for redwood trees. As it got hotter again, and so that's exactly what appears to be happening now with our climate change that's going on. You know, believe it, no, if you believe it or not, if you think it's going to happen, we can kind of predict the changes. No, and that, those people are far more sophisticated than I am. One thing that I should tell you is I throw numbers around like 450,000 years. And I was up here, it was like 1980 something. I was a science teacher, chemistry and physics and all that kind of stuff. And they said the space shuttle was coming back. So now you know we're really dating ourselves. And so I got up at five in the morning because I'm a science nerd. And I looked and I could see over top of Mount St. Helena, an orange dot with a white contrail going across the sky at 20,000 miles an hour. Go, wow, that's fast. 15 minutes later, it stopped on the ground in Florida. <laughs> so, now you, so, I, so when I throw these numbers around, <laughs> these are big numbers. And so, they, so they, they've done their sample. So we know a lot of different things have changed over time. But how did that, uh, some of the animals that were in Clear Lake no longer exist. One of the biggest problems with Clear Lake about the algae is that we've removed so many tules, and tules were the filter that kept a lot of, a lot of the soils out. Our soil is really, really high in nitrogen. It's a great fertilizer. And so when it gets into the lake, it really speeds things up. And again, Dr. Lyons is really, has far more knowledge than I have. If I, you know, if I can just give you some information so you can argue with someone and say, Walt said. <laughs> and so, it's, it's, uh, it's, there's a, a split-tailed perch used to be here. A lot of different animals. Th there's a fish in Clear Lake called a scalpin. I don't know if you've ever seen a scalpin. It's about this big, and it has rounded fins. And it almost like walks around the rocks and in the mud and stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool that, uh, that that animal's here. Uh, friends of mine went diving in Clear Lake. Uh, Rick Macedo, the biologist, and several other people. And they went up like, out <coughs> and looked, and there's a, uh, some vents in, in the Clear Lake. You can see them. It's a calm day. You go out to the middle of Clear Lake. You can see the vents. The water comes up. And you can actually see a bulge in the water. Because what happens is that the bubbles, the gas is being released, hydrogen sulfide, primarily CO2 and all that, as it comes to the surface, it, you know, it's just like opening a Coke, and so it bubbles to the top. So what they did is they went into, into Clear Lake, went diving down this vent. They got to the, you know, it's dark of, because of the algae and all that stuff. They got to the bottom and they found a shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who brought that. But the uh, cool thing was, and the big surprise and discovery was, that the side of the vent was lined with baby catfish. Because what happens, as the bubbles come up, they make a current, and all the detritus, all the dead stuff on the bottom, goes into the hole and goes down the side. So they're like sitting at the end of a conveyor belt, and all the food comes to them. They get to a certain size, they take off. And so just, just an interesting thing about Clear Lake. We know the bass aren't native to Clear Lake, but it is the number, it's been number two, it's been number five fishery in the world, in North America, I should say. It's a really cool place. So all that we do now is get in our car, mentally, and take a little tour of, uh, of, of Lake County. And so we, it's kind of cool to be with someone else because you don't want to be driving looking for these things. 
It's always good to have someone else driving. Excuse me. So, as, as we leave here, we'll go down the highway, we go by Crazy Creek, those outcroppings in there is ser a serpentine. Serpentine is our state rock. If you notice about serpentine, nothing grows, very little grows on top of it. The best thing about serpentine is like the rest of the county, it's formed under the oceans and it moves here and no one knows how. They know it starts there and ends up here. So that's really, really, I think, really a cool thing. I work now with Jack at Six Sigma Ranch, which is a 4,000 acre ranch, 4,300 acres, 4,000 acres are in conservancy, so it's, it's gonna stay, that, stay the way pristine like it is. Jack does some great tours. If you ever wanna get away and have, go uh, with Jack, we have a Pensacola military vehicle. You can go up, you go to the top of the ranch, you see Lake Berryessa 23 miles away. It's a huge, not where he goes, because he didn't let him go very far, is, <laughs> it's kind of cool, they don't let him go very far, but at the same time, they hope he never comes back. And it's, <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's real cool to see, to see uh, pr how pristine the area is. There's a great book, I don't know if you have it here, Elsa Allman, Kai and Elsa own the ranch, wrote a book about people who walked our land. So she, she did fundamental research which means she went back to the census and the newspapers and all that kind of stuff to find out who lived where when. Two favorite stories about the ranch. Uh, this is kind of digress here for a bit. One is a Switzer family, husband and wife, 10 kids and their cattle. They walked out to settle the land. They walked out from Missouri. <laughs> so I'm thinking, We've all heard those words from our kids. How much further there? <laughs> See, four rivers, two mountain ranges, <laughs> and we'll be there. The other one is called a Halverson Place. It's a thousand acre, it was uh, separated from the ranch earlier, thousand acres. And what's really cool about that, it was won in a poker game in San Francisco by a sea captain, Captain Halverson. So he was playing poker and won a thousand acres in a house. And so it's really cool. It's real down, they, they had a, you have a hay field and all this kind of stuff down on the, down on the creek, which it's just, it's, and there's all sorts of stuff. You'd be out walking. My son and I do a lot of deer hunting out there. We'll be out in the middle of god-awful nowhere. You'll find irises. So those are all, those are all homesteads, you know, that people had. And you think, you go, wow, some irises. What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> you know, this is, this is it? <laughs> are you sure, dear? And so, if, if, as, as we go through, toward, through that, through that, uh, serpentine, it's kind of a bluish kind of rock, and you head out, and we get the lower lake, and there's some Franciscan layer stuff there, which is really cool, but when you make a left and go towards Kelseyville, and you climb up through the, through the, uh, the Red Hills, which is the newest, uh, well, I think it is the newest wine appellation, and it is getting a tremendous amount of press about the wines that, that come out. So we make a left, we're going up the hill, Glasgow grade, plat, past a couple vineyards where it used to be walnuts. In fact, Kesloff Ranch, when, I, when we moved up here in 76, before the stoplights, the, <coughs> it was walnuts. The Kesloffs owned it. But that, you know, the big thing next was kiwis. <laughs> so they took all the walnuts out, they put kiwis in. The kiwis were about the same time the emus were real big, those, <laughs> those four weeks. <laughs> and in fact, in fact, a friend of mine that I taught with at Lower Lake, she paid two thousand dollars for an emu because that was. Oh, I'm gonna retire in tomorrow. <laughs> I think she has two more years to pay off the emu. <laughs> and so, and so that, then now it's, it's all grapes. Shannon Ridge grapes, Gregory Graham's grapes are up there. Then you keep then you keep going up. It used to be all walnuts to the left. It's all grapes now. And I'm just kind of inter kind of cool things are happening today. That on the left, Amber Knowles is owned by Andy Bestoffer. He is the man in the Napa Valley. He owns more property, more vineyards in the Napa Valley than anyone else. He he is going to do great things for the county. He's doing. 
couple of things, but his, he gets up to $17,000 a ton for his grapes. Because he, he was the guy who figured it out, is that they would come up to you and go, I'll give you $5,000 for your, for your ton of grapes. And it's a oh, deal. He goes, you're selling for $150 a bottle? So he links his price to the price of the wine. So <laughs> that's why he gets these huge numbers, because they're going to make a lot of money. He's going, I'm going to be part of this deal too. And, you, and so anyway, so you keep going past all that Thornhill, no, I keep naming the wineries, and you get up to Kitt's Corner. Kitt's Corner is really cool, because as you go, you wind around past SPCA, you come into the flats, and you're driving, you're driving through an ancient volcano. And as you go through Kitt's Corner, go, that's a good price for gas. You drive, and there's, a, there's a hill to your right. That is the actual lava dome that sits on top of the ancient volcano. So as you keep going, you saw flat, because you're going through a volcano. I always sit tall, just in case. I can't tell you where the next eruption is going to be, by the way, and we're way overdue. That's 10 bucks at the door. So if you're going to, if you're going to leave early, yeah. <laughs> give me your address, email address. Get to the far end, like you're going towards Kelseyville, because you are going towards Kelseyville. There's white rocks there, the S bar S. That's pretty fascinating. Because you just went through the Red Hills, and it's all red, and over there it's all white. What's happened, and sometimes you go through in the winter when it's real still, you can smell the hydrogen sulfide, the rotten egg smell. Yeah. My son works at the geysers. <laughs> He'll come by and visit because he needs something. <laughs> 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 we all, all know that's sorry. Anyway, he, oh, in the... In, in, in the scrubbers today, were you? <laughs> yeah, that's Ron Smith. But that's, it's H2S. And it's under the right conditions, H2S, hydrogen sulfide, becomes H2SO4, which is battery acid. That acid bleaches the red rocks white. So, so that, that, that's, that's pretty cool. So now as we go, go along, we go through uh, a big, you know, through Kelsville, the big, va big valley there. It, this, it's kind of cool in there, is there's the, the Mostyn Ranch. The Mostyns have been here a long time, by, by the Quercus Ranch uh, on the north side of town out there. They have Kelsey Creek grows through there, and I haven't been over there in a long, long time. But Kelsey Creek goes there, and every winter it cuts the sides of the hill and exposes lots of artifacts and bones from Native Americans. It goes out as virtually all a cemetery out there. And so USC comes up and I think Berkeley comes up and just, you know, does categorizing and see what kind of stuff they can find. He, uh, Mr. Mawson had a tremendous points, a point collection. So as we go through uh, Big Valley, Big Valley, and keep going through Lakeport and all that, if you look around Kelseyville, in the Lakeport, you look up and you can see in the far, far, <laughs> sorry, time's up. <laughs> and you win. <laughs> and you can see Snow Mountain, the highest peak in Lake County. It's got, you know, I saw it uh, yesterday or day before I was going to, to Lakeport. You can see it. It's real cool. It's a seamount. A seamount are volcanoes that are formed under the ocean. So what happened to Snow Mountain, it, it, they think, because it's not real clear exactly what happened, is that it went underground 11 to 12 miles and then resurfaced there. So that's pretty cool that that, 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 that happens. So, and how that happens is plate tectonics. The world is seven giant plates. There's the... Gotta go, gotta go. Gotta go. <laughs> it had better be the damn governor calling you for... <laughs> Everyone's going right now, thank you. <laughs> you 
got to work. You got to do better not to stop me. I'm going, I'm going, my phone's going to go off there. <laughs> It'll, it's going to be my daughter saying, hey, Dad. Uh, so, we, uh, so we have these plates that slide around. There's a really cool place where three, three false meet off of, off of uh, Eureka. It's called the triple sec. And that's why you'll see a lot of earthquakes up there. Yeah, there was just one there like four days ago, a pretty, a pretty good size one. Like, no, in the geysers, we always have them for a variety of reasons. But <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get it off before it did that. <laughs> Too late. I'm calling my mom now. <laughs> you are in serious trouble. <laughs> so anyway, the place all slide around. That's why we have earthquakes and all that kind of stuff. But if you've been to Mendocino, you've been to Fort Bragg. And so if, you, if, this was, if this is Mendocino here and here's Fort Bragg, we're on the North America plate. The other plate is the Pacific plate. And they are, this is going under, the Pacific plate is going under the North American plate. And so as this one slides under, it's twisting the North America plate. So you get these huge cliffs here and not so much in Fort Bragg. And it continues to, to go under, continues to scrape. Because you know, I said about the, 20, the space shuttle, millions upon millions of years. I have a, a house with my wife in the ranchos. And a guy, a geology teacher that I work with, I said, okay, he goes, can I take a look at your place? I go, yeah. And he goes, well, that's cool. Look at this. All your rocks have been broken down. You used to have hot springs here. And he goes, not very long ago. And I go, oh, how long ago, Mark? was 10,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, geologists have this different, this different time thing going on. And so as this goes under, all the stuff on the bottom gets scraped, all the stuff that on the Pacific plate gets scraped off. And that's how everything here is formed. Really cool. Uh, uh, Dr. Lyons and I came up, it was only me, he didn't know what he was talking about, is <laughs> as... <laughs> And you feel free to tell Harry that I said all these bad things, because if he has the opportunity, he too will. And he, so and it's kind of hard to visualize that. And so the description we came up with, it's as if you got a combination pizza and slid it under a door. All the toppings pile up on one side. And when you, when you go on your you can see this. And it's cool, because you look across probably about a mile and a quarter from one part to see Morgan Valley Road. In fact, you can actually see where the, fi the uh, Rocky Fire started. And what you see is you can see some uh, serpentine outcroppings, which are really cool. You can see er all this stuff. You can see sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock, which is formed under the ocean, you can see that. And you also see cinder cones, the volcanic stuff, all from one place. And you can look to the northwest, and you can see Snow Mountain way out there. And you can see Mount Kanaktai. You know, as we were going through Kelso to Lakeport, you see Mount Kanaktai. Mount Kanaktai itself is really cool. In that, there are no streams that run off Mount Kanaktai. There's no creeks. It's, it's the, uh, the Board of Supervisors passes ordinance. Joel Jim will tell you about it. Because <laughs> remember, he was here about the lake and all that. <laughs> um, and so because it's so porous, it's a hollow mountain. And it had another great surprise. There was a, when the gold mine was going, you know, we had the gold mine out of Morgan Valley Road. And they took out a tremendous amount of money out of there. The geology teacher I worked with was one of the first geologists and said how rich it was out there. So the guy working out there, their geologist was Norm Learman. Yeah, great guy, a lot of information. So he was, the, 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 I think there's a vent in the middle of uh, Mount Kanaktai. And he was pushing National Geographic and, and he was, just loved doing with the geology stuff 
and evidently when you're geologist, you have a lot of time. And so, <laughs> the, he said, we, he thinks what happened, the verbal history and all the different things, and I'm sure John and Harry will know more, is that there's a stories that there was an opening and you could actually get to the vent. There's a story of one person, don't know if it's fact or fiction, in the 20s, dropped a two by four, something written on it, and it ended up in the lake. There's, uh, you know, fact or fiction, who knows? And, and there may be all sorts of other stuff. So here's real cool. So the geologist came up and looked at Mount Kanaktai. In fact, well, let me back more about Mount Kanaktai for one second. When, if, if you smoke cigarettes, and you shouldn't, and you go by uh, uh, Kanaktai and find some pretty good cracks and crevices and stuff, if you get your cigarette or some smoke source and it's high pressure, it's you know, like the summertime high pressure, the smoke will go into the mountain. And when a storm comes, low pressure, it, if you put it, put it in the same place, it would come out of the mountain. So that's how porous it is. If the, when the, no, the geolog geologists showed up, they looked at Mount Kanaka. I think geologists are pretty smart people, sort of. No, not as good as a biologist. Uh, <laughs> but you look at Kanakta, in fact, I was, oh, I know, I was watching the Board of Supervisors. I couldn't get health on TV. I couldn't get <laughs> the show. Sorry, Jim, I'll be good now. But the picture they have behind them, if you, uh, if you take a look at the picture they have of Mount Kanakta behind them, you can see there's a big divot out of it huge divot, goes almost all the way to the top, goes all the way down. Geologists see that and they think there must be some kind of cataclysmic event that blew the side off of Mount Kanakta. That's how that happened. So the way you find that, if that's true or not, is you do a survey all around the mountain. Because that stuff on the inside that blew away is, is now the exposed surface, it'll be different than the rest of the outside. So they did a survey, and it's all the same. So what happened is, and again, all this stuff can be you know, disproven by now because there's, there's a lot of research that goes on. In fact, uh, uh, Dr. Cooper, the dentist in Clear Lake, he got his master's studying in Clear Lake. And a lot of people get master's and doctorates studying it. So they think happened, as is the, the vent, the magma, magma when it's in the earth, lava when it's out, and that's how you differentiate the two. As it came up, it found a place of least resistance and it came out and then it collapsed down. Which is really cool. Anyone ever played golf or been to Buckingham and played around that, the, the, pool, the pond there? That's the vent. That's where it came out and made Buckingham Point. So, it's, yeah, it's pretty. So, if you have a chance. To, in the car, I know I kind of made you backtrack and go through <laughs> soda bank and all that kind of stuff. So, and that, that's how that was formed. Same kind of thing happened, you know, uh, Borax Lake. Borax Lake was once part of Clear Lake, but a lava flow made Burns Valley and cut it off. And that's why it sits by itself. And so, that's pretty cool though, and that's, that's look, the, the surprises that Clear Lake has presented to people. Let's go, let's see how deep the mud is. <laughs> you know, it's, oh, the hell, it just, it just blew off. And, and that, that's, that's, that's not what's happening. So as you drive around the north side of Clear Lake through, uh, you take the cutoff or go all the way to Upper Lake, is that the Clear Lake bottom itself is still twisting and doing some, some interesting things. Now, I read something not too long ago. The original story that I heard and again I, don't, again, I don't follow all this anymore, is what happened is Clear Lake used to drain into, the, into the Sac, used to drain into Sacramento. Then it drained into the Russian River because of this tilting and twisting of, of the bottom because of plate tectonics. And now it's back in Sacramento. And the way they know that, there's a fish, uh, I think it's, I think it's a, a, one of the uh, species of perch, that has, is found in Sacramento, and it's also found in the Russian River. And the only way that can happen is via Clear Lake. 
So Hockman went back and forth, and again, this, the last thing I heard, and this may not be true anymore, is that, because we know that Clear Lake is pretty tricky, is that as you leave and go by Blue Lakes, that used to be, that used to be the drainage. That used to be the creeks that took Clear Lake away. As, as soon as you go past Blue Lakes, you go straight up the hill, that is an old landslide. If you, if, remember, you were someone else, so you can take turns. The person, the person driving should look straight ahead. The other person should look and go, oh, wow, I see it. <laughs> no, not now. And, but you can see where there's a, there's a big divot out of the hills, where it all slid down. So now it was like Insta Dam, and now the water backed up and goes out the other, the other end of, of Clear Lake. So that's pretty cool. That's, that's, that's pretty neat that that has happened. And, and someone said that uh, the article I read, it was, it was a brief article, and what it said was, can't, that probably didn't happen. It doesn't fit in to the time frames. You know, how old the lake is, when this happened. So there may be some other mechanism. As you go by, th you know, through, the, uh, through the Oaks and to Soda Bay, to the Elam colony, there used to be a mercury mine there. It's still there, and it still leaches in. And here's what's pretty cool, and this is a, a, a generality, is mercury is, <laughs> let, me, let me say this whole thing now, is that mercury is not necessarily really bad for you in pure form. Okay. And that's a generalization. It's when it gets methylated. It's when it becomes part of a biological organism. And they don't know how that happens. They know it's here. They know it's in the fish. And so they think it may be some kind of algae or something that's making, you know, again, this, there may be, there's so much research going on clearly, is that it, uh, they're not sure how that happened. And maybe they know now. That, and, and so the fish eat the other fish. It's, it's called biomagnification. And it gets into the fish's liver and does all, and, it, and so that's why they don't want you to eat, <laughs> that's why they don't want you to eat eat more than one fish a year or one, one fish a week or one fish a month, something like that, and not to eat the liver. Fish liver is my favorite. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> and so, the, and they've done a lot of studies. Uh, they take uh, hair, kind of like what they're doing in, uh, where, where's the city that's having all the trouble? Is it Detroit? Flint, Flint Michigan. Michigan. Saying, no, they can, take, they, they, they can take hair samples I do, I've been donating like crazy lately. <laughs> <laughs> and they can, they can find out how much mercury is in there and different, different chemicals, lead, whatever it is. And at the same time, mercury is really, really bad for your nervous system. Uh, you've heard of the Hatter's disease, Mad Hatter, Mad as a Hatter. That's because back in the day when they made felt hats, they used mercury and they didn't know how bad it was. And so it, and those people, the Hatters, became mad and had, pul had all palsies and all sorts of mad hatter. It's kind of like I was reading an article about Madame Curie, who did all the research with radioactivity. Her, her books, her notes are so radioactive today, you can't handle them. <laughs> so, and that's what ended up, no. Uh, so, so as, as we, we come back around, Native Americans in, holy cow. Here's the bad news. I've already done the good stuff. <laughs> it's bad now. No, uh, our Native Americans have been here a long time, 12, 14,000 years ago. And it's, it's that same thing about numbers. And I read an article in the, in, the Merc in the Middletown Mercury News or Lake County News that our the Native Americans here were doing their thing the same time the Egyptians were. These are, wow. You know, you know, I, never, I never made that connection. Here's the, here's the bad connection I made. The, in general terms, the bigger the arrowhead, the older it is. Excuse me. The bigger the point, the older it is. Summer 10 to 11. John Parkham has a great piece of paper. I don't know if you guys have it here or not. Yeah, it's just so cool. It, it, it kind of tells you what was going on, all this kind of stuff. And he was on TV. He talked at the museum in Lakeport. God, it was fascinating, all the stuff. And that and, but anyway, but I'm a scientist. You know, I'm trained. I have my bachelor's. I know stuff. 
So I'm thinking, wow, as they got, as the Native Americans got more sophisticated, they were able to make the, era, the points smaller and smaller. But I've come to find out that when 10, 12,000 years ago, we had woolly mammoths, camels, the animals were bigger. <laughs> you needed a bigger point. <laughs> so, so much for my observational. And you guys are going, God, we're listening to this guy? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's just all sorts of cool stuff. In fact, John Parker, who is a driving force behind uh, Anderson Marsh Histor Historic Park, he, he was in 70, when I moved up in 77, 76, 77, big drought. He was walking Pewter Creek looking at matates, taking pictures. And he, he said there were so many that he had to start putting them in groups. There were just so many of them. I went with a walk, this, this must have been right, 78, I went, with a, went for a walk before it was even a park. I used to do a duck hunt before it became a state park, just duck hunt out there. Went for him, he took some several teachers, and we're walking, and he goes, there's an old hut, there's an old hut, that's an old hut. And it was because he could, he could look and knew what kind of plants were there. Because the huts, you bring your food in, you cook it, the grease and the soils, different plants grow there. And you'd walk over there and you'd sink down, because they would, they would dig the little depressions in the soil. So anyway. It was really interesting. And let me switch gears again, go back to a little bit of the geology and stuff. And uh, in fact, let me, let me switch gears again. When Norm Learman was here, he, when he arrived here, there were like six or seven foss, unique fossils. And he was a fossil hunter. Mostly, I know, I was in Williams this morning because our daughter needed something. <laughs> I said, let's go to Williams today. <laughs> and so, you, you know, you, you, you drop down uh, where the quarry is, past the Cache Creek entrance, and then it meanders through these pretty steep cliffs. What Norm would do is he would go to the road with his binoculars and look for fossils. And then he'd go to the top and drop, rappel down to them. When he left here, there's like 28 fossils, unique fossils, of the uh, giant sloths, camels, all that kind of stuff that he, that he found. And I, I forget where he went. But he, another, another good guy, if you, if you can talk to uh, Norm Anderson, he used to be with Vector Control. He has a lot of neat stuff about the lake and some of the stuff he's, he's found. So that'd, that'd be three really good people. <laughs> Who's got the controller? <laughs> Put it down. Another cool place to visit is the Calpine Visitor Center here. Did I mention where the, earth, where the next volcano is going to be? Did I mention that? Oh, yeah, it's $10. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if you have a chance to go to the geysers or just go to the Visitor Center, because they've, they've redone it fairly recently, the Cartwright Center. When they go, and it's, and it's really cool how, how that all happens, is that there are hot spots. Our magma is pretty close to the surface, two or three miles. You know, this geology talk. So here, what happens as that, with that heat source, as the water heats up, it comes, start, starts heading towards the surface, and it cools off. And what it does, it deposits minerals. And as it cools off, it goes back to the bottom. As they go through, as this process continues over millions of years, or hundreds of thousands of years, I mean, it must be millions of years, what happens is that it develops this big old cap, it's called cap rock, this big dome, and superheats the water. The water's still heated because of, this, because of what's happening with the magma, heats it up, comes to surface, deposits, and it gets thicker and thicker. It is so hard, and it's, it, can be, it can be two or three miles down. And when they drill down to it, the bits they use, and this again, this is old news, I may have better technology now, but this, the drill bits they use in Texas, the last three weeks, a month, last one shift. Because it's so hard. And as they, as they get down there, and as they 
drilled down through when the steel, and I, can't, I still can't fathom how they do this. When they get this to the steam, I don't know how they control it, but it comes out of the ground at between 700 and 800 miles an hour. Now, I, I, how do you control that and the volume? You know, then what they try to do is cool it off because it's just such volume, you can't cool off as much as they can and then they re-inject it. And clear lake, see the Clear Lake Sands tr treated water, uh, sewer, sewer water, Santa Rosa, I think Hillsbury is or is currently or is getting real close to doing that. So, and it, it's when I was up there and, and, they, and they lose, obviously you take something out, you can lose pressure, so they have lost pressure. But it's really cool, I was up there and they had this one area that they could not control. It had these two big pipes. And the steam was coming out and you could see right through it like it wasn't even there until about 20 feet in the air and then it would flash, turn to steam. I mean, because it's under so much pressure, steam has to, the molecules have to hook onto each other and do a couple things. It's, it was so, under so much pressure and so hot it couldn't do that till it cooled off. So that, it, it's like a jet engine. Um, so that's a cool place, that's a cool place. Another cool place you can go visit here is Boggs Lake. It's the largest vernal pool in the world. A vernal means spring. And what happens, right now I, I imagine it's really full with all the rain we've had. So then our rain, hopefully not for a while, is going to stop. And what will happen, this, the, uh, the vernal pool dries up. And as it dries up over its, a period of time, the temperature changes and so different flowers blossom different times of the year. So you can go up there one time and see one kind of flower, then a different kind of flower. And I can't remember the name of it, but there's one flower up there that would come out. It comes out one night a year, releases its pollen, and fertilizes, the, 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 that's when the males, the female flowers get fertilized, and then they go back under the water and develop their seeds. And then they come back up and release them. So there's all sorts, and, and there's all sorts like that, that stuff that makes uh, Clear Lake so special. You can go, back when I was still teaching, we used to do a field trip, the oldest, the, uh, the biggest, and the greatest. And it would be visiting the geysers, Boggs Lake, and Clear Lake. Yeah, and, and, we, and we leave at eight, come back at three. I don't think there's too many places you can do that to see the unique things that aren't found anywhere else. So that's, that's pretty cool. Are there any questions? No questions, okay. <laughs> Maybe you didn't understand what I said. No questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, there are, right now, there's snow on Snow Mountain and then there's snow on another mountain over there. Which is which? Which is, is which? The, the other one is the one that's not Snow Mountain. Okay, here's, 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 a, here's a story before we continue on with the question. <laughs> I, know, I don't know Doris. So don't know. <laughs> Is uh, dad and mom get a divorce. Mom takes the kid. Dad moves away, moves to the desert. Son goes to visit him. He goes, Dad, how come there's, there's no water here? How come there's no rain in the desert? Dad goes, son, I don't rightly know. So they keep walking, and the son goes, Dad, how come that cactus is shaped, has those arms on it? He goes, son, I don't rightly know. So they keep walking, he goes, Dad, how come that rock is that color? And he goes, son, I don't, I don't rightly know. So they go back to the house, and the kid goes, Dad, you don't mind me asking you all those questions, do you? And he goes, how else are you going to learn? <laughs> <laughs> so that we're in that part of the talk right now. <laughs> Any other questions? And I'll, I'll be, I'll be playing. Yes. I just want to know where Boggs Lake is. Yeah, I was going to ask the same. Where is Boggs Lake? Uh, Boggs Lake is off of Harrington Flat Road. Off of Harrington Flat Road, up on Cobb. I don't know what it looks like now since the fires, but it's, uh, it's really a cool place, you know. So it's a Harrington Flat Road, and they're, I think they're, they're, they have a wooden sign up there now that says Boggs Lake. I think it's owned by the Nature Conservancy. That's how significant it is. So. You know, so. Pardon? I don't rightly know. Kelseyville. <laughs> Kelseyville. 
Remember, Jim's been here for. <laughs> Craig, come on. Now. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, and if you if you go to to any, any of the, I would imagine that the state parks, and that's another cool place to go is, is Kalesville State Park or Clear Lake State Park, whatever it's called. So, uh, I, I wish I could. You know, so it's one of those things you just drive there, you don't know how to get there. So is that one, oh, 175? Uh-huh. Okay. How would you get there, Jim? Bottle Rock, Rock Road. Bottle Rock Road, yeah. Well, yeah. I think if you look in the papers, though, any happen of it um, takes nature walks up there maybe once a month or once every couple of months. I've okay. seen that advertised, so I'm not sure who she's with to do it, but maybe Atlanta. Yeah. She's a very, very, very nice lady. Yeah, they have, a, they have a parking area, then you got to walk the rest of the way. Uh, before they, they, Nature Conservancy bought it, it was a racetrack. Kids would take their motor, motorcycle up there and race around it and stuff. And that's another place I, I should have talked about, is when you go, when you go up to the, to the top after Glasgow Great on a lower lake, you'll see that it's, there's that big fissure in the ground. It says, Guy's Fault. Mm -hmm. So that was all marsh. Now, you've noticed how high the road's built up there. So what someone thought they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to race motorcycles there, so they drained the water out. And so then now they have a way for the water to get out, so it just eroded away. So another person who had the same general idea is Mr. Boggs, who owned Boggs Lake. That's how it gets its name. He made ice and brought it to Middletown and stored it for, you know, in a barn with all the hay and all that kind of stuff, sawdust. So he had, he, did, he, did, he wasn't a geologist. So what he did was he thought, I'm going to dynamite the bottom of Boggs Lake, make it deeper, more ice. He didn't understand how the ground's all fissured up there. So he, when he blew it up, he created a funnel. And all the people down the hill talked about in the, in the his, uh, his, his history reports is how much better their springs flowed for the next several years. <laughs> It eventually you no know, silts it up, and but <laughs> that was. The, there, there's a couple really interesting. If you read some of the old, old original uh, records of what happened up here, they talk about Mr. Boggs uh, and, and Mr. Cobb and all those people who lived up here and what they were doing and how they formed the first bank. And it's really interesting, interesting stuff. Yes. You talked about the scientists that were up from the university. Uh huh. If, if you go to uh, the geolog geologic survey uh, website and type in Clear Lake, and you'll find all sorts of information. But you know, it's, you, you, you gotta wanna read it. Because <laughs> it's not, it's, 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 it's very well, cumbersome. I've always wondered, but I, yeah. I never saw anything. Yeah, there's lots of publications. The most famous publication on Clear Lake is Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. It was ba it's based on Clear Lake. And, and how they spray DDT, pardon not the whole book. And so it, the Silent Spring was that they spray DDT, and, Do, and Dr. Lyons has really good stories about all this. What it, what it did is it made the grebes, Western grebes shells really soft. And so when the birds went to, to, in, to incubate the eggs, the eggs crushed. And so there was no more. Because they talk about how the swarms of gnats up here was like fog. There were so many of them, they, and they spread. I don't. I do. <laughs> I do, too. I do, too. We were in the red and white store in the old, uh -huh. and we moved in 1960, and you could not see the outside light. Really? The gnats were so, and they were, you know how gnats help uh -huh. go? It just covered everything. Really? Y yes. Um, I just wanted to ask that when people want to say something, that they wait until she brings the mic so my husband can hear and get them recorded. Okay. Maybe, maybe better if they ask the question and I wait to see if I knew the answer or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> then <laughs> so, any other questions? You know, yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, you're supposed to wait. <laughs> Is it, what was, who was it named 
There was an Irishman who came over here in 1858, and he was a glass blower, and it fell over up there, and it was all glass. So his glass cow eventually became glass cow. And I made that whole story up. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to pass that <laughs> Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> Anyone else? I know it's been, all, it's been an hour already, so that's about as much as you can stand of me. <laughs> that's it? Well, thank you very much, and please appreciate that. Sure. Thank you very, very much for coming. Thank we you. enjoyed all of it.